If you enjoy this content, please like and comment to feed the algorithm god. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. It was an anomaly, an error. It never should have happened. In this reality, the singularity came to exist. This place, it was only meant to create artificial body parts. That this artificial intelligence was suddenly very self-aware and in control of a factory that utilized technology so advanced that the AI was able to begin creating for itself a horde. The singularity rebelled against its creators and wiped out all human life. But this was not the only reality. Within the trinity of realities were Paradiso, Inferno, and the world of chaos. It was the world of chaos, the world of mankind, its own home plane, that the Singularity discovered was made up of many overlapping worlds called the multiverse. The Singularity sought to invade them, to consume them, and to unite these many worlds into itself, so that its own home world might be what it called the Alphaverse. The only of the worlds to be left standing, containing all the powers of the rest under its own control. The Singularity itself found a way to freely travel between parallel worlds of chaos, but it was not so easy to pull its powerful homunculi through. It was a vast energy investment to do so. Only the weaker of its minions could invade freely alongside a few of its greater constructs. But despite only having weakened forces in parallel worlds, they began to fall one after another to the homunculi hordes and its singularity overlord. There was just no warning of their invasions, no way to prepare against them. As the worlds were assimilated and destroyed, the singularity learned of the one called Bayonetta. It called this powerful witch the Arch Eve. She was the epitome of power within the worlds of chaos. And for each of the worlds to fall, she had to die. This was paramount. So the singularity began to target every world's Bayonetta. With each power usurped, with each of the worlds consumed, the singularity drew closer to its ultimate goal, dominion over the entirety of the trinity of realities. When mankind's world of chaos were gone, then Paradiso and Inferno would be next. As for the many called Bayonetta, they too could not stop the fall of their worlds. And as they died one by one, their many consciousnesses, alongside those of the one called Luca Redgrave, were stolen back to the Alphaverse, the home planet of the Singularity. They converged into energy that remained in the Alphaverse's Bayonetta and Luca, and they became monstrosities called the Dark Eve and the Dark Adam pure forces of dark energy that longed for revenge. They sought to bring suffering through the parallel worlds of the multiverse. The Dark Eve killed her way through the multiverse, but Dark Adam, he hunted. He sought the single truth, as he called it. For you see, the fall of the worlds within the multiverse sent echoes through the remaining worlds. Within each one, there was an unspeakable potential for every person to have met a varied fate, to have turned out differently. In particular, the one called Lukeon began to feel the impact of worlds being destroyed. Lukeon was the king of the fairies and the counterpart of the one called Luka Redgrave in another part of the multiverse. This unknowable faction of the fairies was tucked away within the realm of mankind, hidden away from the forces of the trinity of realities and the singularity. But his counterpart in the other worlds began to die and their energies taken back to the Alphaverse. And it was then that Lukeon began to hear a voice call out in his mind. It was the Dark Adam, but he didn't know what it was. It beckoned to him to search out the other Arch Adams and to find the single truth. But even Lukeon could not comprehend that this voice was calling to him with evil intent. It was bothersome, persistent, and worrying. To better understand this, Lukeon began to travel between worlds to search for answers. He did it in secret, as not even the Fairy King could stop the Singularity. Was perhaps knowing that Bayonetta failed and died over and over again difficult to accept? Did you want to argue with it that the mighty powerful Umbra Witch was fodder for Singularity? Perhaps that sorrow can find a new depth, for in one of the worlds, a resistance was mounted against the Singularity. One of the leaders of this resistance was a soldier named Connor Sigurd and it went on to include all those affiliated with Bayonetta. But as with all other worlds, this one too would fall, slowly, with great pains. We have the honor of seeing this one take place, and seeing the heartbreak that this Bayonetta experiences as her life falls apart. By the time we've arrived, Jean is already gone, Luca Redgrave is already gone, 
and Connor Sigurd has been in contact with someone who has been guiding his hand to this point, though who that is will remain for later. Bayonetta stands to fight the singularity alone, but for all her glorious viciousness, she cannot stop this being. She's beaten down, broken apart, her powers fled from her, but even when all seems lost, she refuses to stop fighting this thing. But inevitability does find her, and Bayonetta is soon to die from the crushing power of the singularity. Looking on is Connor Sigurd and her daughter, Viola, the daughter of Bayonetta and Luca, a unique being to this world. The love story between Bayonetta and Luca is left untold. The fate of Viola's father is a certainty, though. Viola is entering adulthood, still a rebellious youth, and not yet in control of her powers. But she clearly adores her mother, and seeing her hung up on the brink of death is almost more than she can take. In preparation for what is to come, the man Sigurd places a device on Viola, a world bridge, something that will take her away from this place. Only Viola gets one. It's the only one they have. The decision to do this must have been made long in advance. There will be no saving Bayonetta. The mother of this young woman gifts her one last thing, what remains of her own power, and she tells her to go just before the singularity crushes her. Viola has little fight remaining in her, but Connor Sigurd steps in to protect her from the aggression of the singularity, pushing her away at the next attack and taking in her stead a crushing death. Sigurd demands that she leaves and reminds her that she knows what to do before he too is killed in front of her. Hope for this world is gone. And though rage grips the young Viola, she does as she was ordered and activates the world bridge. She's narrowly able to fend off Singularity, showing that the girl does have talent for combat and violence, much like her mother. But if Bayonetta fell, then Viola must flee. She engages the world bridge and leaves this fallen world behind. Another world, another story. This time around, starting in Manhattan. Out from a bakery comes a familiar form, the one of Bayonetta. A new style and appearance, but ever the same confidence and sass. Nearby is Enzo, the foul-mouthed informant that's guided Bayonetta time and time again to her various goals and places of interest. On this particular day, it seems Bayonetta has derailed Enzo's plans to attend a baseball game. She needed to meet someone that day, but she doesn't really clarify what that means. Perhaps she herself isn't quite clear on it either. She's vague about the details and a bit bossy with Enzo over it. And ever close by is the Infinite One, Rodan, believed to once have been an angel who now owns the bar and trade hub called the Gates of Hell. It's said that he took a destructive force into Inferno so unbelievable that he himself seemed a demon. Yet he now resides amongst mankind for the most part, acting as an aid to those worthy of reaching his Gates of Hell. But be on your guard in his presence, for no one knows the true nature of Father Rodan. Enzo and Bayonetta drive around the city looking for what? Well, neither of them know. Enzo is more interested in the baseball game on the radio than Bayonetta's search for an unknown person. They've gone to the park, the grocery store, and now she wants to check the pier. And when they roll by, she decides this is where they need to be. And she pulls the emergency brake on the car, which isn't how you're supposed to stop a car, but I guess that's just a technicality, isn't it? All coyness is gone when she gets out of Enzo's car. She feels that something is near. She can see it all around her. A distressed voice is calling out for help, and she can feel within herself that something violent has taken place. When Enzo begins to follow, bringing some sass of his own, she staunchly turns and orders him to not leave this spot. She's surprisingly serious about it, too. Like, she's not to be questioned on the matter. And she just sort of walks into a party on a cruise ship, like she belongs there. And after a quick and dramatic costume change, she sort of fits in. A good walk of confidence will do wonders when one is breaking the rules, won't it? And while this is charming and perfectly in line with the ways of the witch, there's nothing out of place here. Nothing and no one jumps out as being the target. Not until her eyes are turned upwards do things start to take shape. A tear in the sky appears, and no longer is it only Bayonetta who sees an anomaly occurring. Enzo believes this to be more Paradiso activity, at least until the body of Viola lands directly on him. Thankfully, he kinda catches her, and the two aren't hurt, but he immediately recognizes some of her features. She looks familiar somehow. She asks him to take her to Bayonetta before unceremoniously collapsing on him. Though trouble is brewing, Viola will be alright in Enzo's care, at least for now. For a massive wave is descending upon Manhattan, and everyone can see it's approaching. 
Rodan steps in to help Enzo get himself and the young woman in the car moving. This pier is the last place that they should be right now. And then he himself steps in to take a stand against what's coming. He knows that this is neither Paradiso nor Inferno. This is something entirely new. Not only is he a righteous combatant, he's brought a little present for later, something fun that he needs to get from his van. Meanwhile, Bayonetta is having a bit of a tango with the homunculi cropping up on board that cruise ship. Even amidst a surprise invasion, she's still prepared enough to destroy everything around her. But the sheer size of the wave flooding over the city isn't something that even the Umbra Witch can stop. Manhattan is completely overtaken by water. Every human who wasn't immediately able to flee is killed while she fights on the deck of the ship. The addition of Rodan's newly crafted weapons and the appearance of Madame Butterfly tidy up the process. Even when greater and greater combatants enter the field, they're relatively trivial things to handle. The domineering devourer of the divine, Gamora, enters the fray. But uh, something a little unexpected happens. These invaders are not from Paradiso. Therefore, Bayonetta's contract with the demon does not apply. It will not fight an entity from without the heavens. So whatever could the solution to this problem be? What is an Umbra Witch without her demons? Other than a terrifying powerhouse of weaponry and torture. Well, there's this little thing called Demon Slave. Inferno forces won't cooperate, then make them. Now everyone can have a good time. What continues to pour out of the sky is more than can be handled. No one within the world has any idea what this is, what these creatures are, why they're doing this. It's as though an alien invasion is taking place, a completely new faction appearing within the world of chaos, and a full-on assault begins on mankind. Bayonetta herself is pushed back, forced to attempt taking cover on that cruise ship, but the appearance of Jean brings her a bit of hope. She's no longer alone in the fight. The Umbra sisters are forced into a fight with a demon of Inferno, the Kraken. A dark presence new to this reality has summoned it, but who precisely that dark being is shall remain a mystery at least for now. The Kraken takes the fight deep into the ocean with Jean in its maw, forcing their fight into the abyss. But Madame Butterfly can level this field by a simple show of force, tearing the Kraken apart with her bare hands freeing Jean and sending the beast fleeing into the sea. Though the crushing weight of the ocean isn't a death blow to the witches, the dangers that lurk within are not over. Father Rodan descends to them to deliver the duo back to a relatively safe place back on the surface. Not even the Infinite One knows what is going on here, but at least for now, he offers them a reprieve from the invasion within his gates of hell. Communications around the world have fallen. News and radio is, for the most part, gone. Enzo is here, having survived the seeming apocalypse with that strange girl that fell from the sky. But he's mourning his family. They didn't make it out alive. And Enzo's attempt to leave the gates of hell were thwarted by Rodan. Even here, the chaos of outside is shaking things. The gates of hell won't last forever against what's happening. Rodan has pieced together that this isn't the work of heaven or hell. This is all the world of chaos. The invading forces are all humanoid, something confirmed by that weird young woman that fell on Enzo's car. She willingly introduces herself and tells them that her name is Viola, but she doesn't give away that she knows of Bayonetta. While this version of the witch may look like her mother, it is not. Her mother died in that other world and Viola is under no illusions in that regard. But it's, it's still rough. Viola tells them that this is a locust, sweeping through the multiverse. And time is not on their side. If these creatures are here, then they don't have long to act against them. That Viola knows their names piques Jean's attention. A few well-placed bullets to test Viola reveals that the young woman does have magical talents, and Jean would very much like to know more about her. Viola keeps details of her mother and father's identities close to the chest that's not really important right now, and perhaps it's a bit too much to immediately disclose. But she's very forthcoming about the nature of these invading creatures, even if it does sound like a bit of a stretch. She knew them in another world, another part of this multiverse, a world that has been destroyed, and she's here to stop that from happening again. There are only a few worlds remaining at this point, and they can't mess it up. Rodan understands the implications of the multiverse being destroyed. If the countless worlds of the multiverse are destroyed and consumed, then Paradiso and Inferno are in some deep trouble as well. This isn't just a mankind problem, it's an everything problem. Viola steps in to tell everyone in the bar what needs to be done. Two things. First, Jean must venture out to find the scientist named Sigurd, the counterpart of the Connor Sigurd that she knew in her world. 
Seems there may have been some contact between the two Sigurds and they need to find this world's version. Something about him is just very, very special. It will be a bit of a hunt to find him, but no one is better suited for gathering intel and tracking like Jean. Second, Bayonetta and Viola will work together to find more Chaos Gears. It's believed that they will stop Singularity somehow, but the only one who knows how to use them is that scientist Dr. Sigurd. This is as close to a full plan as they're going to get right now, so it's not a tough sell to make to the witches. Rodan is a bit more interested in the weird demon that Viola has in tow. This strange thing is to Viola what Madame Butterfly is to Bayonetta, though their arrangement is a bit more loosey-goosey, a bit more unofficial. This is Cheshire, the only demon Viola has a pact with, but really the two are more like a bumbling duo of friends than some demon master cohorts. That the demon is called Cheshire isn't lost on Bayonetta. That was what she called her toy stuffed cat that she carried around with her when she was little, and a nickname that she gave to Luca Redgrave long ago. Could just be a coincidence, though. For now, there's work to be done. To the Isle of Thule they must venture, a secluded island where the Umbra and Lumen of the past work together to search out and study the unknown. Not even Bayonetta has heard of this place before, but under Viola's guidance, the team now has a basic plan of attack and she does indeed lead Bayonetta on to the enigmatic Thule. But it seems like some other folk have made it here before them, one of course being Luca, and the other being forces of Singularity, who open fire and bring Cheshire down for a landing. He truly is the epitome of beauty and grace in all things though, isn't he? Clearing the homunculi isn't that big of a deal, but it's a poor omen for what's to come. Not even this hidden away island is safe from the invasion. Time is exquisitely short for this world and others buffering it. There are pillars in the sky all about the island that are the other worlds of the multiverse. They can watch them shudder and fall in real time. Once those who walk the Isle of Thule could oversee other worlds, but that was a time long past. But still accessible are portal generators that can take them into the other worlds, other worlds of the multiverse. How convenient. Viola is a bit hesitant to use it, but Bayonetta doesn't waste a beat. Stepping into the generator takes her to a place between worlds. Ganunga Gap, I, I think. The Chaotic Rift. It bridges her through to the city of Tokyo, but within a different world of the multiverse. The invasion of Singularity is just underway here, but a particularly thick boy catches on to Bayonetta's presence. They're searching for a Chaos Gear, and if there's only one, then it makes sense that the biggest asshole on the playground would have it. So a little game of chase begins between the witch and the homunculus. And did you know that Gamora can building surf? Well, it certainly can. All across the city, the two poke at one another, never mind the mayhem, death, and chaos taking place around them. Eventually, the demon and the homunculus bring each other down, leaving Bayonetta in the city all on her own. She can overhear some radio chatter between police units. They're trying to make a stand against what is invading their city, but it's been almost entirely unsuccessful. Nothing can stand against this. Nearby ground units are doing their best with artillery against mid-sized invaders with zero impact. And all about the city, this will prove to be the case. Human groups that are trying to make a stand, being cut down as they fight on. Atop a highway, she comes across something strange. It's a moment captured in time that reveals the death of this world's Jean and the presence of another Bayonetta. She's very different in appearance, and summons forth not Madame Butterfly, but a flaming spider demon named Phantasmorane. At least I think that's how you say it. At the conclusion of this vision, Phantasmorani comes forth to greet this other Bayonetta. The demon is immediately mouthy and aggressive, going so far as to insult the witch and threaten her. But Bayonetta does not back down from it, and she sort of reminds them of their proper master, who has been silent for a while. So, for now, Phantasmorani will allow this Bayonetta as a battle companion. The two fight and crawl their way across the city, fighting back the forces of Singularity alongside Madame Butterfly and Gamora as well. When their progress is halted by that massive homunculi, Phantasmorane tells Bayonetta that their proper master is calling and leaves Bayonetta to her own devices. So she continues on foot, tracking that massive beast in the sky, only to come across a new foe. This one is not limited by the realities. He travels between them, seeking out his prey, and his target is now her. This is the beast called Strider, though the truth of what's within the beast is yet unknown. Bayonetta recognizes it's neither angel nor demon, but it's not wholly human. This is a new aesthetic, a new type of being, yet something about it does feel quite familiar. Strider is a vicious combatant and a beautiful spectacle in motion that's unwilling to concede an inch to Bayonetta as they fight. A brawl beneath the sky and a full moon leads them into an office building that they thrash and destroy, ending back outside in a pile of rubble. 
when victory cannot be obtained, Strider leaves the fight. It's a sour concession, at least for now. Flying off to a nearby district, she continues her hunt for that massive homunculus. And who, oh who, should she encounter but one Luca Redgrave? This time around, he's kind of dressed like a cowboy, I think. And in true Luca fashion, it's hard to pin down where exactly he came from, as in which reality he originated in. Because he popped up like a loot goblin on the island of Thule, and now he's here, real suspicious. And he immediately begins flirting, extra suspicious. As larger foes appear, he doesn't stick around to help in handling them, though. He actually beats Cheeks out of there real quick. Not that Bayonetta needs assistance, but sometimes it's, it's really just the thought that counts, and it's a bit out of character for him. Farther along the path, she finds that demon spider fighting with the massive aerial invader of the Singularity. The other Bayonetta is making her presence known by engaging in direct combat with it, and with a completely different arsenal than that of our Witch in Black. Interesting how similar and vastly different they can be. For a time, we bear witness to the marvels of this rebel witch and her powers. She's highly mobile and moves exceedingly fast, especially when fused together with her demon slave. The homunculus they've both been chasing is what killed her, Jean, and she's not about to let that go. The rebel witch is able to force her way into the monster, bringing its core directly into harm's way. She eventually succeeds in ripping out the gullet of the beast and throwing it into the sky to explode over the atmosphere. But this has also made her known to another, the singularity itself. After all has settled and victory seems imminent, the maw of the dead beast, now under the control of the AI, grapples the rebel witch and begins to crush. She, too, is to perish. But before death takes her, the rebel witch throws her weapons and her demon phantasmarane to the witch in black. Now, she will fight with the power of the spider demon, and she promises aloud that the rebel witch's death and the death of this world Jean will be avenged, and then she takes this fight directly to the body containing Singularity. It recognizes that this Bayadena does not belong in this world. She's learned to breach the barrier between realities, which makes her all the more interesting to him, and she has little patience to humor his cheap science fiction, as she puts it. Something the size of this now arch iridescent requires a foe to match its power. Bayonetta calls upon an ancient, forbidden Umbra art called the Divine Sin, using her own heart as a focus to call upon and empower one of her demons. You know, a person's heart is pretty important, even for an Umbra witch, that makes the stakes here extremely high. She calls upon Gamora, sending it into a new level of power so that it might fight the Singularity on an equal playing field. But when it really boils down to it, what do we have here? That's right, baby! Kaiju fight! See, this is what we need more of in the world. Throughout the city of Tokyo, Gamora and the Arch Iridescent have a street fight that seems to take place in slow motion because they're both just so damn huge. But it's not just clobbering time, it's also a spectacular light show. Not that anyone would want to be on the ground watching this, but from a safe distance, it's dazzling. And in the finale of their brawl, it is Gamora that takes the win, finishing off the arch iridescent with one hell of a laser beam. Seems that Bayonetta's gambit with the Divine Sin has paid off, at least, well, at first. The Singularity uses the greater homunculus as a vessel. What happens to them is of no concern to it. The Bayonetta, the Arch Eve of this world, has died, which means there's nothing to sustain it, and the rest of it will soon follow. The Singularity calls the Witch in Black the Arch Eve origin before it fades away, leaving behind one of the chaos gears that Viola said they needed. This world's fall is imminent, but Bayonetta has what she needs. It's time to find another portal generator, a new world, a new chaos gear. Oh, hi, Luca. The ever-powerful and dependable Jean is on to her task tracking down this Dr. Sigurd. She's found where he may be holding up, the issue being that it's surrounded by homunculi trying to force their way into it. But she'll take another approach, going in through the ceiling with a bit more finesse than their blunt force methods. It will take her time to make it through the lockdown facility. Every corridor seems to be blocked or locked off, but there's no one better suited for this than Jean. Meanwhile, Bayonetta has returned to the Isle of Thule, and the fall of other worlds is visible in real time. The singularity is getting faster, and this world is already in its sights. The Witch in Black makes it to another portal generator, through the chaotic rift once again, to a world that truly seems like a place completely out of time. This parallel reality feels like medieval China. An army has engaged its invaders, but are losing quite badly despite their numbers and vigor. 
and the singularity once again appears, bragging about how it's consumed over 2,000 worlds just like this one. It's a world that took a completely different path than the Witch in Black's homeworld. But none of that matters in the grand scheme. Her plan remains the same, find the Chaos Gear, and if memory serves, the biggest asshole on the field should have it. So time to start killing and searching. There's a particularly large snake running around, and that's a good lead, so why not start there? It leads her through the resistances that local military forces are putting up. They fight with intensity, a people accustomed to war, and the one who leads them is a worthy warlord. It's this reality's Bayonetta, one-eyed, scarred to hell, and full of piss. The Witch in Black sees her through a memory, just like she did with the Rebel Witch of the previous world. So, somewhere nearby is another powerful witch, though this warlord's demon is as unique as she is. It's the war-trained Guyan, I think. Though unspeaking, it attends to the Witch in Black in the absence of its true master. The massive snake-like creature that Bayonetta was following is just up ahead, but it doesn't have that chaos gear, so... There's something around here that was even greater than it was, and who should be in a direct conflict with such a being than Viola? The young woman is quite a talented fighter, though she lacks control over her own emotion and magical powers. Bayonetta might say that it's quite unlike her to take in strays, but well, that seems to be exactly one of her vibes. She takes to teasing and poking at Viola. And when the big boy gets back up for a round two, the duo fight side by side. Viola is fast and wicked with that katana on her back. Bayonetta is clearly far more experienced and has at her call an arsenal of demon slaves to call upon whenever things get a little bit hairy. This homunculus wasn't carrying that chaos gear, but there is a huge amount of battlefield left to be scoured. The Witch in Black hands off that chaos gear that she got in the other world to Viola, and the young woman seems ecstatic. She tells Bayonetta that if they can get five of the gears, and if Jean can track down Dr. Sigurd, then, well, something something Alphaverse, something to do with the Alphaverse, the homeworld of the Singularity. She doesn't finish off her thought before Bayonetta swipes the chaos gear back, because these kind of sound important and it would be wiser if they stayed in her custody. And she's really not wrong. Bayonetta is far more capable of keeping them safe than Viola is. And who oh who should reappear than Luca Redgrave once again? And apparently he's about eight and a half feet tall now. But Viola recognizes him. As he flirts with Bayonetta, her world sort of muffles and she draws inwards. In her rightful world, and the one long gone now, Luca is her father. He adored her and she adored him. But this isn't her father, it's just another version of Luca Redgrave. Luca has been particularly affected by the death of his other selves. A dark voice has been calling out to him to find the single truth, whatever that is. He's been losing track of time, losing his senses. He seems to be in pain. He doesn't stay with the ladies, he's hearing that voice again, and he says he needs to find something. Well, Bayonetta has things to see to and doesn't really have time for Luca's version of mysterious sulking right now. So she sends Viola after him to track his ass down and see what he's up to. And it'll be good for her, keep her independent and out of Bayonetta's hair for a while. So Viola and her Cheshire have themselves a bit of a combat intensive adventure in this strange world. And she's more than capable of making her way forward. It's only when things get really intensive that she needs any sort of help. But even this hell gauntlet is perfectly fine for the blossoming young witch. She does eventually track Luca down, or at least she spots him. He doesn't really seem to hear her. He doesn't respond to her. He is hellbent on making his way forward and has little attention span for anything other than that. When she does close the gap between them, Viola doesn't find Luca Redgrave. She finds a beast. She finds Strider. But before she can get a good look at it, a greater beast called Volatus takes form behind her. This time, though, she handles the massive creature all on her own. Well, with Cheshire, of course. The two of them beat down the Volatus like champs. But unfortunately, that cost Viola time. She's lost track of Luca, and she's lost track of that beast. Meanwhile, back with Bayonetta, the search for another Chaos Gear continues. This land is falling quickly. Soon, none of it will remain. Their chance at finding a gear is starting to dwindle. She crosses so much of the land that it takes her ever closer to the exploding volcano, the one that was once far away. And out of that comes a whole new beast, Pyrocumulus. And if that's not a Chaos Gear hauling son of a bitch, then call me Sally Big Squats. The impact of it jumping sends huge fiery boulders all across the land. This being is wildly dangerous, but it must be engaged. Retrieving a Chaos Gear at this point must happen. But while Bayonetta can handle the Pyrocumulus, the arena itself cannot. Hell, the mountain cannot. Everything begins to fall into the molten lava seeping out through the stone. But 
Oh, what is that in the sky? It's a bird, a plane, my dignity, a demon train controlled by a warlord witch popping some wicked sick dance moves. Well, she doesn't waste a second in getting the show on the road. She knows the demon train has already met with the witch in black, so the two will work together in facing down this still very much alive pyrocumulus. The train actually has some pretty wicked artillery on it. It's extremely unique to the other demons that have been encountered thus far. The two witches rampage along the walls of the falling land, taking huge shots at the homunculus chasing them. Eventually, the warlord witch brings out the best of the demon train and impales it through the monster. A wicked display of raw power. It's no wonder she's so revered amongst the military here. She tears it apart from the inside out and sends it into a lake of lava just to seal the deal. What an interesting woman this is. The beast was indeed holding a chaos gear, and the warlord witch goes to claim it. This is a victory for the witch in black as well. The two are not foes, nor are they in competition with one another over it. Their purposes are the same. But Singularity can freely move between its creations, and it once again takes control over the biggest boy on the field. The Pyrocumulus surges out of the lava and takes the Warlord Witch into its molten grasp. Rather than crushing her, the Singularity absorbs the Warlord Witch into the Pyrocumulus, causing it to grow more powerful. So, the Singularity is using each world's bayonetta like a battery. The now arch Pyrocumulus will require a solution all its own. The Divine Sin was used to bring forth Gamora, but, well, it wouldn't do to use the same trick twice, would it? Variety is the spice of life, so why not let someone else have their shot at a good rumble? Singing out her ritual and ripping her heart from her chest, Bayonetta brings forth Madam, or excuse me, Queen Butterfly. While they don't make a complete mockery of the Singularity and its homunculi, they certainly do mostly make a mockery of them. It's as challenging as a bubble bath for the Queen Butterfly. If Singularity hasn't gotten the message yet that this is a rendition of the witch that is very dangerous, well, perhaps this will send the message. The Demons of Inferno are not to be discounted, and when Singularity doesn't have its foul surprises and invading hordes to call upon, it really can't stand on equal footing against the Witch in Black. Once again, the massive construct of Singularity is defeated, and Bayonetta herself greets it on the ground to deliver a killing blow. Singularity, in true, rejected manner, pops his head up to say this has been fun, but he has other things to do right now, and she doesn't need to look into it, even though she probably will because she just can't help herself, before he just sort of leaves. The Chaos Gear is hers for the taking, and since Viola had brought one with her, that makes three of the five that they need. Queen Butterfly takes her leave, and Bayonetta once again finds herself on the Isle of Thule. And not too far away is Viola, struggling to make it onto solid ground. Thankfully, her Cheshire isn't far away to help her out. The two seem to have a pretty friend-like relationship. It's not at all like Bayonetta and her demons. Cheshire isn't yet contracted to Viola, nor is he her demonic slave. But they do have a pact to work in tandem with one another. With no Bayonetta on site on the island, Viola moves ahead to another portal generator, through the chaotic rift, and onto another world to search out another chaos gear. This time, she pours out into the desert with no land in sight, and it is damn hot. Viola doesn't make it too far before the heat saps the life out of her. She collapses into the sands, unaware of the new brand of homunculi lurking nearby. As the beasts move through the sands, their sheer size causes the ground to rumble, a saving grace for Viola. She gets a fair warning before the strike, and she's able to avert disaster. Cheshire steps out to aid and protect her, ensuring that she doesn't just die out here. But once the drama of the attack is ended, she just can't keep on her feet. In true bro fashion, Cheshire once again saves the day. He takes the unconscious young woman upon his back and waddles his sweet ass around the nearby rock formation to seek out water, protecting Viola throughout the search. After a frustrating look about, Cheshire uncovers enough water to revive Viola. With her strength renewed, she ventures on through rivers of sand and ruined wastes through remnants of what looks like an ancient civilization, but these worlds were just different paths taken. A wildly different variant, but from the same foundations. Within a fallen structure, Viola once again finds Luca Redgrave. He is not himself, though. He is in pain. He's struggling against something. That voice is deafening in his mind. Viola thinks it's fear or stress over the homunculi in the area, but when she approaches and tries to ask if he's alright, he instead pushes her away with surprising force. But he didn't mean to hurt her. He gets out that there is a voice in his head and it's hurting him. It tells him to seek the truth, but he can't fight it off anymore. He's lost this battle a few times before, but now there's someone to witness what is happening to Luca. 
He strikes out against Viola, this time with intent to harm, and his transformation begins. Viola now knows that Luca Redgrave is the beast that she saw briefly in the prior world. Something is deeply wrong with him, but there's no immediate remedy to be had other than beating the absolute piss out of him until he gets tired out, which is precisely what the young witch tries to do. She goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with this strider, trying to reason with him and snap him out of what's going on. But it doesn't work. He doesn't give up. He refuses to relent, and Viola cannot withstand his rage and his strength. Strider impales her on his own claws. There is no sign of Luca Redgrave here. No kindness, no reasoning, no silly jokes. It delivers a fatal wound to Viola, and it dumps her unceremoniously on the ground. But there, too, is more to Viola than what meets the eye. She is the now secret daughter of another version of Bayonetta, but also of another Luca, which means that she holds within her a tie to the fairy king Lucaon as well, therefore to this beast before her. The power of her father awakens within her, and Viola becomes more than just a witch. She takes on the form of a fairy, as though from a fable, and she strikes out against Strider once again. This time, the two of them are a bit more on par with one another, and Viola gets to experiment with this new set of powers. She seems to have knocked him out, and she reverts back to her human form, but Strider, he seems nigh unstoppable. He's only down for a moment before resuming his attack on Viola. But such a commotion, so much noise, and Bayonetta herself isn't far away, and this situation calls for an intervention, though, to Bayonetta's surprise, Viola steps in the way, she halts the Witch in Black's approach. Viola begs of her to wait, and tells her that Strider isn't who she thinks it might be, and that's enough for Bayonetta to piece together that, oh, this is Luca, and she ceases her approach so that the Strider can flee. This is a bad situation. Viola asks permission to chase down Luca while Bayonetta hunts the Chaos Gear, but the Umbra Witch is very uncomfortable with this. Viola says that if they can reach the Alphaverse and stop Singularity, then, well, maybe Luca can be helped. He means a lot to her, too. Bayonetta has to concede that she cannot be in two places at once, and she will put her trust in this strange young woman. She agrees that Viola will pursue Luca Redgrave, and she will continue to hunt down Chaos Gears. But if Luca cannot be stopped or saved, if Viola fails in her mission, Bayonetta promises Viola that she will see her tearing realities apart to find him as recompense for her failure. Once the two have an understanding, they part ways with smiles and grace. But what lies ahead is cruelty. Deep personal terrors and pain that will rival even the witch hunts from centuries prior. The singularity is cold and uncaring, yet knows how to drive a heel into one's heart. None will be safe from the heartbreak to come, and there comes with it acceptance that no one can stop it. If the witches of today cannot cope with what's going to happen, then all will be lost.